<laughs> okay, and we're back. Okay, so before break, we uh, you read over the the tennis kata and thought about how about the game of tennis and how it scored, and we brainstormed uh, first as individuals, then as pairs, then as groups of four, and then reported out as the whole class on uh, some scenarios that would validate this uh, the functionality of this kata. And then we also talked a little bit about how one might implement all of this. Sorry, I'm going to make this there you go, thing two. That's eh, too big, thing three. Now, uh, let's take some time and implement it. <coughs> so uh, to uh, help you, and, and I'd like you to implement it in, let's try pairs. Uh, tonight, don't ask me to work with facilities. Here again, we're going to learn. Um, so uh, what I did to uh, help you get started was here in my Portland State uh, Java Summer 2018 uh, repository in GitHub. I created a tennis kata Maven project, which is uh, just from the, I, I used that student project, that Project Zero, and renamed things tennis. And so what it gives you is things like a tennis class, and it gives you, you know, the integration test and the unit tests and, and stuff like that. Um, and uh, if you'd like, uh, if you want to get started, so if you want to get started with the code, one way to do that is to clone this repository or fork it on GitHub too. It's a public repository. I posted a link to it on the, uh, uh, on the, uh, uh, the, the Google uh, Plus community. Uh, and so uh, go ahead and fork that, get started. Um, and this should be familiar because it's exactly like uh, the, the archetypes for the, the project one. Let's do that for, I don't know, 20 or 30 minutes or so. Uh, see how far people get. And then what we'll do is we'll join a Google Hangout and you can share your screen with everybody via that. So let's do some uh, pair programming. So and one computer? Two people on, one computer. On, on one computer. Give that, give that a try.
So we're going to have to see the game, I guess, by passing the command line argument. So I would do yes. main or yeah at all. I would not even I would I would you need to try to run all the tests out. I wouldn't have the main to play when it's short. I'd have main call something that's I can see like we're saying yeah. I was gonna have like that. Oh yeah, no, I'm gonna do that. We can do it that way. So we're gonna do something that's a good thing. Okay. Uh, I would put main. So this is how I'm sorry. I have to stick on this kind of So I would have tennis and me. Tennis and me. So you could just one class. I would do two. Uh, you have a class in the scoreboard. You have to know you have to do it. Yeah, you get a class. And um, it has all that stuff. Yeah. And then you can call your main, whatever holds your main. Because they're in specific things. I might want to take something that says zero. One and say that's you know, right? You know, saying that's where I can put all that logic and things. Okay, so in our scoreboards, what's our first use method? I mean, so increment like you had. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just created a dictionary. 
Pause this real quick. Oh, 
Okay, time for a report out. So, on the uh, Google community, I have posted a link uh, to a Google Hangout. So, let's see here. Let's join the Hangout. It's me, I'm huge. Don't you see that? There we go. So, can people join this Hangout? I'm the only one here. I look so lonely. Is anybody able to join the Hangout? He says, hopefully. I'm huge. Okay, cool. Okay, uh, Brent, Ian, Neil uh, have joined. And so what I'd like you to do is uh, share your screen, unmute your microphone, uh, although that might cause some feedback. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to sound, and I'm going to turn off this. Oops. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Neil, who's Neil? Neil, how about you go first? So unmute yourself and share your screen. And you share your screen by, uh, let's see here. Oh, how come I can't share my screen? Just like somehow not have share screen or something? I don't know, share screen. So, okay. Mine looks different. So, you go into the three dots, of course, and say share screen. Okay. Awesome. So. Okay, so Neil, how about you unmute yourself? That way it'll show up on the recording. Can I unmute you? No, I can't unmute you. Oh, hey, pro tip. There's um, something in IntelliJ called uh, presentation mode. You can use that too. So if you go under view menu and you say presentation mode, it might be a little easier. Oh, this is an IntelliJ. Nice, okay.
Hey, Neil, are you, can you unmute, please? Yeah. Well, actually, right now I'm getting some audio from Thomas, so can you, uh, Thomas, can you mute? And... Oh, it's not, okay, can't use your microphone? Okay, fine, then, uh, are you plugged in back there? Would you mind coming up in front of the class so we can all hear you some more? Oh, you, you get to use, like, the podium, too. We'll call you Maestro. It'll be up here with your... Yeah, you know, time is there, yeah. Okay. okay. So, so yeah, so, uh, so, well, so tell the class about, uh, about how you approach the program. Well. You and your team, you're, you and your buddy. Yep. So this class just remembers two scores, and then remembers the game is over or not. We had the spring words <laughs> so words isn't being used yet, okay? Or, yeah, I think there's an initial design plan that got abandoned. Okay. Somewhere. But, uh, so, construction, a new game, uh, zero points, so it's not over. And, and then it's pretty basic, player one can score, player two can score, and I guess the most exciting thing is this thing which displays all the possible scores that could be. And to test it, we just uh, nice. hardwired in the game and get some okay. points. So what does that look like when you run it? So, it looks like that. I guess we can run it again. Nice. So each time, we also have each time a point to score that it calls the display to score. So uh, player one kept scoring points after it's over, but then it's so great. So like your main like simulates the entire game, and is it the same game every time? Or is it random this it's, small? No, or? it's just we just hardwired in yeah. as, as a simple test. Player one scored one points. Nice. Okay. So yeah, me me if you make uh, more fancy, but that's right now it's just real to test. Cool. Okay. So like, uh, what are some things that you learned from this experience? Uh, not very good at Java, so it's good. It's good, <laughs> it's good practice for remembering what commands to use. Uh, we have this this system out dot format. We're trying to remember oh, yeah, how, yeah. how to do a print line using C style formatting, and then uh, somebody in our team to just format our the print line that worked. Smart. Okay. Good. 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 Yeah. So. Cool. Excellent. Any questions? Anything about the program? Yeah. Okay, tennis clap, everybody. That was very nice, very nice, very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Okay. Uh, who wants to go next? I'll call on somebody. Okay, come on. Come on up. Uh, so I didn't want to do the three dots here and a screen share. Okay. Nice. Uh, Brent, yes, okay. Good, let's bring you up. And can you un unmute your uh, self? Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. It's a Doctor Strange movie from the 70s. So, yeah. Do you mind coming up in front of the whole class? Cool. Okay. All right. So we started. We didn't get quite as far because we did a lot more of the tests. So that's super small. So go from your um, view and go into enter presentation mode. Better? Boy, the light. Oh, and that's awesome. Um. So. So we have our uh, tennis class, which is essentially just a two individual ends players, a uh, hash map to map between our scoring system and the actual nomenclature that's used in tennis. Um, we wrote a bunch of tests. To get to Ooh, right okay, now. so do um, uh, command in. So that'll search for a class by its name. 
Perhaps not. Uh, yeah, Command O, maybe? Uh, okay, well, it's anyway, so yeah, so tennis cast or whatever you call them. Nice. Ah, okay. Excellent. Uh, so essentially, we started off by testing that a game was created, the score was even. Um, we have our score, uh, we tested that. Player one scoring commenced correctly, player two scoring commenced correctly, so we approached it from like a really small standpoint, doing one tiny little step at a time. Uh, time yeah. um, there's the constructor initializes correctly. We read the score, we checked that uh, the win conditions for player one and player two without getting into the whole juice advantage thing yet. Um, so player one just outright wins, player two outright wins, all that stuff uh, ended up working. And then we were just getting to the point where we were going to get score, which was going to return a string. Uh, with the score, uh, specifically in tennis, there's this weird thing where if they have the same score, they just say all. So we started by testing love all, um, and we were getting into that. So I'm not going to do that. Oh, we'll do that. So here we go. So here's the actual code. So we started with the constructor. The only reason we have a constructor uh, is because of the mapping visualization. Apparently, if it's an ant in Java, Automatically sets it to zero, so you don't actually need anything otherwise. Uh, real simple, incrementing the score, um, yep. testing if there was a winner, uh, where his winner returns actually who was going to win, and once we had our actual play function, we were going to use that to have some kind of player one wins output. Um, this is where our get score was implemented, so the first line up here, we've got our all conditions where if it's a match and it's less than four, uh, because now we're, we know we're not in deep advantage play, um, we can be there. Uh, otherwise, just output player one score, player two score. Um, we just got to the deuce condition and we stopped. Um, so we haven't done any of the advantage stuff. Yeah. Nice. Okay, so like, what are some of your takeaways from this? So what did you either get out of pair programming or uh, you know, what, was, what, what was helpful and what maybe hindered you in terms of writing this code? Um, I mean, the TED stuff feels kind of slow right now mm -hmm. still, just because there's so many edge conditions, especially in this tennis case, that um, it kind of is like, how do we make sure this does the right thing? Or yep. Having some kind of design plan in mind. But the pair programming, for the most part, you really catch all the errors before they actually happen. Nice. Oh, that's good. So you have two, two eyes on it. So. Awesome. Any questions or comments from the audience? If not, yay! Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, actually, Brent. Actually, okay. I do. Yes. It's something I noticed after working with uh, my, my partner here. Uh, the private. So fields and classes in Java. Yes. You're, you're, they're all private. They should be private. Or is it what? Is that a dog? Is that kind of a preference? Or? Yeah. Is my yeah my audio is being recorded. Um. So yeah. So so why should we make stuff private? I'll, I'll ask you. What do you, the viewers at home, think? Why should? Uh. Why does Java? Why why do these object oriented programming languages have these visibility modifiers? Encapsulation. Okay, what does encapsulation mean and what does it give you? Uh, data, hiding. data hiding, right. From, from whom are you hiding the data? Everybody. The government. Everybody. Yeah. Everybody. Okay, everybody will invite yourself when you're private. Okay, what about some of the other visibility modifiers? What do they mean? It's like protected. What does that mean? Uh, only be modified by. Uh, I'll make it wrong. Sorry. Yeah. Protected? It's only modified by. And it's not, it, um, well, pa yeah, package is also part of it uh, in, in Java. So protected, and it's not about who can modify it, it's about who can see it, who can access it. Because you can read it, too. If it's, you know, so, so the whole idea is that uh, you, you've got four levels of visibility in Java. Um, the one with the least visibility is private, which means, so a private method or a private um, field means that only members of the class can see it. 
Uh, so for private fields, what does that buy you? Encapsulation, but practically speaking, what, what, what does that mean? Exactly, right. You've, you've got data which is in uh, the complete control of that class, and so you don't need to worry about someone else messing with it. Right? So it's like, okay, yep, you keep it here internal. And, it, and really encapsulation and these access modifiers are all about um, exposing functionality, so state and behavior, uh, only the state and behavior that you want to be exposed. So uh, for instance, you know, hey, maybe you've got um, a value that is read-only. Or maybe that you've got a value that when it does change, you want to put some validation logic around it. So let's see here. In your, uh, in your programs, like what would be, uh, well, maybe in Project 3 that might be a good example? I'm trying to think. Um, let's say, okay, you know, let, let's say there was, uh, yeah, okay. Let, let, let's say you had a silly requirement on your phone bill, like uh, you know you can only have a maximum of 100 calls in a month on a phone bill, uh, I don't know, right? Okay, how would you implement that? Okay, right, have some, some counter, or uh, how did you guys, in your project one, how did you guys store the phone, bill, phone calls in a phone bill? An array list, yes, there you go. So there's a collection that's a collection of phone calls that's in your phone bill, right? And you put that in a field. Do you remember the access modifier that you put in that field? Did you put an access modifier? Did you pay attention to it? Okay, what are some of the options? So what happens if that field is public? Right, anybody can see it. Anybody, if they can see it, they can modify it. They can add all sorts of stuff. Well, okay, that doesn't seem so bad, right? Because everybody knows that a phone bill has some phone calls. But if you had that, but if you, but, but, but how would, in that case, how would you enforce that the phone bill can have as most, as many as uh, 100 calls? You can't, right? Because that, that object, that, that array list, has then leaked outside your class. You can't be certain that, uh, you, you can't be certain that someone hasn't gone and added 1,000 phone calls to your phone bill. So, in order to implement that kind of logic, you need to encapsulate your data. You need to keep it close to you and control access to it. So that, that would be protected if you want to see it, but not modify it. Okay. No, uh, it'll um, see it, but mo not modify it. No. Know, you want, uh, what if you want somebody to be able to see, oh, I've got, only, I've got 90 calls and only 10 calls left, but I don't want somebody else to subtract 50 from it. So what you ex so, so uh, the underlying co collection then can't get out of your site because the collection itself you can have an unmodifiable collection, but you want to be able to modify your collection under the right circumstances. Right. So you got to control access to it. So like the add phone call method controls access to that underlying collection by that by saying hey this is the only code path in which you can um, in which you can add a, a phone call. I'll get to it. And you also have a get phone call. Do you have a get phone calls? Yeah, you do, right? There's, there's get phone there's get phone calls. Now, probably the other implementation that you have is you simply return your array list. Okay, uh, that, you know, that, that's correct, and that'll work, but then it exposes it to the outside world. And so then, what are some options that you might have to still be able to answer the question, what are my phone calls, but without exposing that, uh, exposing like the internal data structure? Yep. Make a copy of it, yep. There's also um, there's also a helper method. I think it's called collections dot immutable list. And what you do is you give it a, 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 an array list object, or you give it a mutable, a changeable list, and then it wraps it in an implementation of list that where if you try to add to it, or if you try to remove to it, it throws an exception and it makes it essentially immutable. And that gives you protection there. So yeah, you can make a copy of it. And so who cares if they go and modify it? It's not the underlying data. This is all about data encapsulation. This is all about good object design and good object oriented programming. Right? You need to figure out what it's okay to expose to people outside the class and what things ought to be kept on your own so that either you can ensure the integrity of your data or that um, you're able to modify the implementation without having to worry about what other objects might be dependent on that object. So anyway, so that's why they have uh, encapsulation. That's why they have the different modifiers. And again, there are four different modifiers. Private means that you can only be used inside that class. Um, 
Protected means that you can be used inside that class in any subclass, and also the package. If you don't have a modifier, the default visibility is just within the package. And you've probably seen me do that in some of the tests, where I'll have like a method on the class that's under test, and it'll be um, I'll change it from private to, uh, to to package protected. And then public means that anybody who can see the class can also see that uh, that member, that method, or that field. Okay. And much more details in the object oriented slides and stuff like that. Okay. Let's, uh, who else wants to go? Who wants to go next? Okay, you got, oh, so that was a question I didn't answer. Yep. So, part of the problem, I know we're, like, I would like to make those player one and then player two private. Yep. Testing purposes, is there a way without running unnecessary getters to actually access those for doing tests? So, yeah. So what, what I would do, so yeah, don't, don't make it public, make it package protected. So take off, so no modifier, which means that classes inside the package can see it. And your test class is inside the same package as your class under test. And so they can be able to see it. That's a very common pattern. And so that's, uh, that's cool. And actually there's an annotation that you can put on it that says at visible for testing, which is a clue to the reader of the code that says, oh yeah, right, the reason this is package protected isn't because it's meant to be called by other domain code in the same package, it's because it's meant to be called by tests. Good questions. Okay, we got one more and then a break. So, who wants to be the person that takes us out? Okay, you. Let's see here. Can you unmute, please? I'm sorry, and you are? I'm Levi. Levi. But that's Cole on there. Cole, oh yeah. And Ms. Cole. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, and so if you can unmute and then share your screen. Okay. Oh, my phone's blocked. Oh, yeah, in the top right. Oh, and so uh, who who is that? Vid or oh, sorry, vid you. Uh, can you mute, please? Okay. Well, forget it then. Okay. Uh, it's me. we decided to go with a tennis class and a player class. And we kind of made all of our coding decisions around the idea of let's have an enum to represent the different words for the kind of score and then rely on the underlying integer values to just increment them. We didn't really know what enums in Java, how they worked before this, so we did a lot of googling to make this work. And as a result, we have some code that looks a little less mean than we wanted. But, um, Pretty simply, add point is the bulk of the work for the program. It checks if you have the score, um, if you're equal, if someone else um, gives advantage, increments your score, whatever you need it to. And then sometimes calls a you win method that will print you win and end the game. And this is where most of the work is done. And then in the tennis class, which is pretty much our main, we have a main down here. It just does a while loop and randomly adds a point to either player one or player two. And it does that until the UN method from player is called at some point and ends the game at that, that way. So what this looks like when we run it is just like this. So you can see it will print out the score of a player when they score and then just, it'll do that until a player has 40 points and is under the right circumstances to win. At which point it 
you win. Uh, let's see if we can get lucky here and get an instance of multiple 40s at the bottom. There we go. It'll loop between them two just to show off that it's doing advantage and eventually a player will win unless some weird chance happens and we flip on the 50-50 every time forever. And yeah, that's awesome. got something working by the end. Super cool. So you have the main. Uh, did you plan any automated tests for it? We didn't really have the time to do that. We just kind of jumped right into it yep. and uh, kind of ended up with a waterfall thing, which is not something to recommend. But That's right. Don't go chasing waterfalls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's what we came out with. Okay. Awesome. Uh, so how do you feel about how, you're, you sound pretty confident about this stuff. So you mean you didn't you know you didn't have automated tests, but you know, you've seen the output enough times that you feel like you're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. yeah, yeah cool. Uh, any particular learnings they want to share in the class, or anything that uh, you said? So, so actually, tell us about enums. So you did some learning. What, okay. What's the enum all, enum all about? So enums are not as use, or as simple as I'm used to them being in C plus plus. We had to call an ordinal uh, method just to find out what the underlying integer was. If you want to like increment the next uh, integer, here, uh, am I even speaking anymore? Uh, like sure, me. There's some side view. Uh, I, I can show like what. Thank you. Go back. To that. Looks like it's Stop screen sharing. It. Oh, you didn't click share. Oh, I didn't. I see. Well, I don't want to share this code for the project. Oh. So, <laughs> well, I've highlighted this in some videos. Lines, so, yeah. Here. I don't know. What's what this do on Spotify? <laughs> <laughs> oh, here we go. Which is a waterfall. So, yeah, coincidence. <laughs> so, just to like, increment to the next enum, we had to do something where you call a values method, which returns essentially an array of all the possible values for the enum, and then you can press score.ordinal plus one for the index, and then set score to be equal to just what that prints out which is not as easy as enum plus plus, but it still works in the end. Oh, interesting. So, um, so, uh, we, so it's true, like here when you have to say that you know, the score, the ordinal four, the score is less than, uh, less than three. So that, like, for me, when I read that, it's like, oh, which one's three again? So I gotta go look up there and see which one's three. Um, but I don't think you can use less than with the new, but you can use the new value with equals. So if you get rid of the call dot ordinal, you can replace that with score equals equals 40, is that three? 40 is three. Okay, so I think it's easier to read, right? So if you say score equals 40, ah, I know what that means. The score dot ordinal equals three, I have to do some work there. But I'm a little slow, so maybe this is okay. Yeah, otherwise, super nice. Yeah, okay, good deal. Let's, let's learn about a new Java language feature. Any uh, questions? Okay. Uh, you like a question. Uh, yeah, yeah. Just wondering, like, your preference on how we kind of go about implementing something like that. Would your preference be that instead of working in main, we work on, on an integration problem? Um, because we don't even really do it. Well, if you, right. So, so in this, uh, I won't bore you with the details. You can look on GitHub. But I implemented this too, and I just did it, not surprisingly, TDD, and so I've got, you know, a bunch of the scenarios that we called out, and I implemented them, and yeah, my main doesn't do anything. The, the, the you know, the, the project didn't really call for uh, a, a main method, so for me, what makes the most sense, especially since the way that we approached it by identifying all those test cases, it's like, okay, implement the test cases as a unit, as a, you know, each test case as a unit test, make it pass, and go through. It'll be in the beginning of the screencast, you can... You know, we can watch me do it or watch me do it quickly if you want. Um, that, that's how I would approach it. And I think there, uh, I think ultimately that lets me, it gives me that fine-grained unit testing that I'd want. And then I would focus the integration testing on sort of the more coarser-grained tests. Which, since we don't really know what the behavior of the main method is supposed to be, I don't know how I would implement that. 
But that, but like for your projects, for instance, that's that's what I would do. Okay. Let's take another break, and then we'll finish up with a discussion about uh, project three. Um, and then also there was a particular kata that somebody wanted me to, to go over, so we'll do that too. Not kata, cone. <laughs>